Welcome to the Niche Pursuits Podcast. Today we're joined by Carlos Meza, who is the CEO of Crowd Content, a content publishing agency. As you can imagine, Carlos has a wealth of knowledge in the content space because he sees so doggone much of it as the person who's in charge of the uh, the content engine that's behind uh, crowd content. We get to, to pick his, uh, his thoughts on content, ranging from how to create content that ranks. Um, he calls it uh, people-first content, which is, which is uh, similar to what Google calls it. We talk about what are the details to creating people-first content, to creating quality content, as it were, you know, like what defines quality content? What are the things that actually make content quality? And he shares a lot of great insights and thoughts there. Uh, we talk about creating article outlines, uh, the importance of article outlines and the process to go through when you're creating an article outline. Uh, we talk about scaling content, the, the mistakes that people tend to make when they move from writing all of their own content to outsourcing and thus scaling content and kind of land on the right approach for that. I ask him straight up about AI content and how it's going to have a role in content creation going forward. Does it have a role? Where does it have a role? He shares some pretty cool use cases and some pretty cool ideas, not from a high level, some pretty in-depth ideas about how to use AI content today and going forward. Crowd Content just recently acquired Content Refined. I feel like I've said content about 100 times already in a couple minutes. They just recently acquired Content Refined, which is another content agency that we've had on the podcast previously. And so we get to kind of wrap up and hear about the differences in these services, um, when to go with each of them, and, and what makes each of them unique. Very good, uh, very good interview all about content and all about how to do content. Uh, I think you're going to learn a lot from it as content is so critical for all of us who are, uh, who are creating websites today. Hope you enjoy. Welcome back to the Niche Pursuits podcast. My name is Jared Bauman. Today we are joined by Carlos Meza, who is the CEO of um, Crowd Content. Welcome on board, Carlos. Thanks for being here. Oh, thanks, Jared. Thanks for having me. I'm very excited. It's, uh, it's good to have you on. So you guys from Crowd Content just recently acquired Content Refined. Now we had Narciss on, I was trying to figure out before we got on the recording here, maybe nine months ago, I'm guessing. And he talked a lot about about content creation and, and what he's seen from working with so many brands. So today we're, we're going to be diving into content and talking content for websites. Before we kind of get into the nitty gritty, can you give us some background on yourself and, and talk about how you got into, uh, into crowd content and, and your history? Sure. <laughs> so I, I, I said I'm a rehabilitated banker. So I was a corporate <laughs> banker for, for uh, so don't hold that against me, but. <laughs> okay, it's okay. <laughs> Yeah, a good part of my life, I, I, I was uh, working for big banks, you know, like Citibank and, uh, and the likes, uh, 13 years. But funny enough, I was, uh, I'm an engineer by training, but uh, I think banks find engineers very useful as we know a lot of math. <laughs> so we're yep. highly math trained. So I really never get a chance to, to, um, to use my engineering for other than, than, uh, than finances. Uh, so I did that for a good chunk of, of my, my young life uh, after after school, um, I started in Colombia, moved back to Canada uh, with, with one of the banks, uh, with HSBC back then. Uh, but then after a while, I just realized that I wasn't just, I wasn't happy. <laughs> like there's something that is not, that is not uh, really, I, 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 something missing. And it's funny when I met Spencer uh, the first time and he, he said, I used to work for, for Wells Fargo. I, I felt so identified, you know what? Yeah, I was going to say Spencer has a, ba a banking background, and so it seems like we we tend to have uh, maybe a little bit of a of a community that's growing from ex banking into into content and websites. <laughs> yeah, well, and 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 I think it's just you're there uh, and you see so many businesses, and and I met so many entrepreneurs, and they were still more successful and just very interesting people, right? Uh, they just were different, uh, and I I was always wondering what would it be to be on that end of the table, right on this end. And you, when you work for a big bank, you know, like Wells Fargo or Citibank, you're just a tiny mouse in a huge wheel. You're just a, another clog in the wheel, right? So there's like, I felt my soul was, was dying every, a little bit every day. And I said, look, I, I need to get out of this before, before it is too late. Uh, because it's very easy to be trapped in a very comfortable life with a pension and benefits and all that stuff. I had a young growing family. 
And I said, look, if I get, if, you know, oh, I had a third kid on the way. And I said, if I get more comfortable in this life, I'm never going to, I'm never going to step up. And I don't want to get to, to, to my midlife or 40 and say, I never tried it. So again, yeah, fast forward, I decided to quit the banking life. Uh, I raised a fund uh, looking for acquisition. So our first acquisition was a SaaS company. Uh, and I went to run a hundred people SaaS company without no, no, knowing any, nothing about running SaaS companies. So, but I did that for, for a few years. And then after that, so we, uh, I exited that company and uh, I, I was thinking about the next thing. And I was fortunate enough to get a call from a group of investors that said, hey, we have this amazing company out of uh, British Columbia. We want you to take a look at, we might need somebody with, like, with, uh, with your profile uh, to help us take it over, buy, uh, close the acquisition and maybe you know, help us run in the future, but why don't you go take a look? So I looked at the company and fell in love right away. It was a small company where I was running again, a, a, a hundred, hundred people company. And this company had like 50 employees and it was very small, but it was just going like a rocket, right? It was growing really, really fast, had an amazing clientele and the space, I just fell in love with the space, the, the, the SEO, digital marketing. I, I, I thought to myself, look, this thing is going to explode. And COVID, uh, the pandemic is just making it, accelerating that process. So this is gonna, this could be a home run. Doesn't matter. It's small because we, I, I have an opportunity here to make it really big for the next few years. So I decided to, you know, pack my bags, move my family all the way from Ottawa to British Columbia. Well, it wasn't a hard decision, Victoria's people. <laughs> so um, to be fair, it, it was an easy decision. But really, I just fell in love with, with the company, fell in love with the industry. So yeah, we bought Proud Content out of the founder. The founder has been doing it for over 10, 11 years, I think he was, he was ready to move on and, and, and just kind of step back a little bit, you know, has to bootstrap and grind it out for, for, for a decade. So he was now, he wanted to take some liquidity, some chips on the table and let somebody else help him get to a next level. So he rolled over some of his equity. We bought most of the equity out of him. And then I took over as CEO of Crowd Content that was, you know, in 2020. So it's been a great ride since then. So I'm really fascinated to hear about your entry into this space, but from a very different angle than the vast majority of us. A lot of us, probably the vast majority of us, we get into it for maybe the same reasons. We want freedom from the workplace, from being a cog in the wheel, but we go about it by starting a website or by uh, becoming a writer or et cetera, et cetera, maybe doing SEO services for other companies. And we get into it that way. You went about it by acquiring a company and a company that does these types of services. What about it from the outside was so attractive to you about this space? You said you fell in love with it, but why? What, what's so attractive about this space? And maybe compare it to some of the other spaces that you've seen as in your banking career and why, why you like this one so much. Well, it's one of the things that I learned very early on when I was starting to look at acquisitions, um, it was about tailwinds, right? There's nothing like sailing when you have the wind on your back. Is a much is much easier. Uh, so when you look at the tailwind, so e-commerce, right? Just the, the digital marketing in general uh, and content, right? So everything like you you put the, all those things together and everything is just points in the uh, uh, growth and growth hides not hides but helps you offset a lot of mistakes. We're all gonna be mis make mistakes, um, but. Growth is always, uh, when you have the growth on your back, it's easier to make mistakes and keep going. When you don't have the growth on your, or the wind on your back or in a more mature industry, your execution has to be uh, you know, flawless or you have less room for error, right? So if you, like me, I'm a still, I still consider myself a rookie CEO after being doing this for five years, right? I'm not, I don't have 20, 30 years of running companies to say, okay, I know exactly what I need to do. And the execution, this is exactly what I need to. So a, a person like me with, uh, with still feeling like a rookie CEO, I need a lot of room to make mistakes. But again, I think these, the, our industry has also democ democratized uh, the economy and entrepreneurship in a way, because really you can just start a, a website from the corner of your desk, mm -hmm. um, from whatever in the world, and then you can start, a, it can, can start a very profitable uh, and very fulfilling business from wherever you are, right? A lot of people have heard the stories. They, they have their nine to five job at a big corporation and they can start their website about their passion, something that they're, that they're passionate about. They can start, start writing about it. They can become a very successful entrepreneur. So that part also kind of, uh, I, I really thought was amazing helping people, uh, helping freelancers on one end 
to have a, a you know um, access to 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 very interesting jobs. So helping the writers to do that, and also helping entrepreneurs to achieve some of their dreams or helping them grow by you know giving them a platform to find uh, to find content uh, or, or produce content in a, in, a, in a very effective way. So all those things with the growth, I think that was very very interesting to me. It's interesting you took over you know at 2020, which was the start of a pretty big shift in the world and whatnot. Did that pose any you know, interesting challenges to walking into a company where the world was changing all around you and you were trying to still figure out what was really going on in the space and with the company itself? Yeah, of course. So we uh, we spent a lot of time looking at that um, and looking at wh- how the company behaved throughout the pandemic, or at least... So we closed the transaction in November. So we had the chance to look at what had happened when the pandemic hit, right? So March, April, May. And it was very interesting because, and I don't know if you saw this in, 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 in the industry, but so pandemic hit March and April, March and April, everybody's like, okay, nobody, nobody moves, nobody gets hurt kind of thing. So nobody did anything. So everything, everything paused. And I think we were all trying to figure out what is going to, what is going to happen with this whole pandemic thing. But then May and June came back with a vengeance when people realized, all right, this might be an opportunity. So people in e-commerce or in content and digital or in digital assets, you know, they realized, okay, now there's a huge opportunity because anybody that wasn't online needs to come online. And people that were kind of somewhat online need to go hard at it. So um, we saw, you know, uh, the, when look looked at the number, the company's numbers, March, April were kind of, you know, a halt to almost it froze, like you know, d- um, decreased seventy percent. But then May, June, July, it was all that pent up demand came back with a vengeance and really started really taking off. So when we closed the year. In despite the acquisition and on the pandemic, the company had grown at 40, 50 percent that year alone, uh, despite, you know, being in a, an impressive event in the middle of a pandemic. Right. Ooh, I, I can only imagine. I mean, you know, obviously it's kind of like how you describe it, like the world went on pause for a while, but it was pretty quick when people realized like, oh, moving to digital is going to be the way of the future in so many industries. So many industries had to go from a brick and mortar to a digital environment. And this was the push they needed. So I can only imagine that, that like you said, that, that the, the groundswell must have started to work to, in your favor after a couple months. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's how that's how it went. And I think since then, uh, really, uh, I think the, the pandemic accelerated the digital transformation process by by maybe half a decade or a full decade, right? Because a lot of people that was weren't online and weren't had plans and, you know, maybe to do it in the next five, 10 years, they just had no option. Otherwise they wouldn't exist anymore. Ah, it's interesting. Well, let's talk about 2022 when we're recording and obviously beyond, but you're now knee deep in content. You're knee deep in working with a team of writers and a team of content producers. I'd love to start off by getting your perspectives on why content is so important for SEO and any kind of global or, you know, large high level insights you've learned about content as it relates to SEO for, for websites, for prop, for web, uh, website owners, excuse me, and beyond. Yeah. Well, it's just, um, it's really a fundamental, um, is the main thing around SEO. I think from my perspective is content, right? Because at the end of the day, you know, Google's mission is to organize the world information, right? I think that's, that's how it goes and content of information. So really, like they say in finance, cash is king, and SEO content is king, right? So it's, it's very hard to have an SEO strategy if you don't have good content. People come to Google to find stuff, mostly information, right? Or, um, or to just know how to learn something, how to do something, to find something. So, and Google wants, or not just Google, but the search engines, they want to provide this amazing service to their user uh, and give the information they're looking for. So the only way to do that is with good content. So that's why you know uh, the main pillar of any SEO strategy has to be uh, strong content or high quality content. Do you have a specific approach that you guys recommend taking when it comes to content? And I know that's a very open-ended question. I'm sure it depends on a variety of factors, but content is such a big game, it's such a big term, it's such a big world. And for someone just starting off, they might be able to get their mind around the idea, okay, content is really important, but do you have any thing you've seen or any approach you guys take that you feel works a little bit better when you get to the specifics of it? Well, yeah, like you said, that's a very big question and I'm just trying to figure out where, where, to, where to start, where to tackle it uh, best for your, for your audience. Um, 
but I think I think it's about principles, right? So we should create content thinking about a human at the other end, right? And it's what we call it people first content. I think Google calls it people first content, right? Some people, I think, come to the industry thinking about the end result, right? I want to, I want money. I want to have my own business, and then the content and the SEO is a means to an end. But the problem is that then they're using the content as a tool to get to that end goal, which is create, you know, traffic and create money. But they're not thinking, I need to provide value to my users so I can earn value from them, right? You know, so I can earn the right to, to, to earn money out of that. And the, the way to, 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 to do that is with quality content. Is the reader, is the user going to come out of, you know, when they leave my site, they're going to leave satisfied thinking, I, I got something out of this site. I got something out of this content. So in terms of principles, they're like create content, thinking about the user. What is best for the user? What are you trying? What is the message? What, are you gonna, what is in it for them, right? Can you connect with them? Don't think about how am I going to monetize my ads? My ads, like how can I, it's, it's about the content for content first and then, and then everything follows, right? So the content is really the start. If you're in the content game, if you're a, a, a affiliate website or, or you're a publisher, um, Content should be the start of the show. And then you should, you should approach, tackle your content in how can I create the best experience, the best quality that I can for my users. That's really, I think, the way to approach it. Now we can get into tactics and how to do all those things, how to think about quality content and how, could, how to use content to, to, uh, to increase your traffic. But uh, to your question, how do we approach content? I think it's about first principle and it's about, all about quality and it's all about the user experience, all about the reader, because that's very aligned with what Google and the search engines want. Well, piggy, so piggybacking off that is perfect. Piggybacking off that, what uh, we could go and read what Google has outlined for us on what you know people first content is. It's very amalgamous and <laughs> kind of <laughs> theoretical and doesn't use very many specifics to say the least. And um, what 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 in your opinion or what have you seen even better is what 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 would people first content be like? What is quality content? Maybe. Is it some examples you can give us some some structure or some frameworks around what that looks like? Yeah, so I can give you some 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 thoughts here. There are a, f- a few ways that you can you can think about people first content or people or content for humans. One is like ha- have your own. The content has to have its own voice and its own personality, and uh, people shouldn't be afraid to express their opinion. You know, and, but, but you got to be careful. Make sure that this is an you differentiate what is an opinion, and what is a fact, but. Um, I think uh, people want to hear what do you what do you what what do you have to say about 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 a topic, right? And I think that content is going to perform much better than just bland, neutral, non-position taken content, right? Because you want to create that authority, but you know, have your own voice. Let your content have personality. Make your content like you're talking, like a conversation, right? Like we're uh, unless you're writing something extremely scientific. You can have a very conversational, and, and people want to read how people talk, right? I don't want something that's going to be very dense and heavy uh, and very, you know, extremely technical. So, you know, create something that's going to be easy to read and it's going to be engaging. But have your own voice, have your own personality, have your own opinion. Now, the other, the other way to create um, high quality com- content is have data, like, and have if you can have original data and 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 facts, that's that's going to be. Uh, it's going to make your, your content stronger. And why is that? Because, okay, you can have an opinion. That's, that's awesome. But it's nothing better than an opinion supported by facts and real facts that maybe you took the time to gather yourself, right? Or even, you know, I've, I've heard great articles, but they cite different places, you know, these data and these data, these are statistics, nothing better than, you know, supporting your, your opinions with facts, with data. And it's the same. We're having a conversation. And if I express my opinion, I can, you know, Put some data behind it to um, to support that that opinion that I have. And uh, another way to have um, good quality content is have actionable insights um, or, or or really teaching the user how to do something. Right. So if the user walks away from your article or from your piece of content, say, "Oh, now I know how to do the thing that I I, I want," or at least I'm, I'm walking away with one insight that is going to be useful for me. Right. So again. When you walk away from the content or from the or from the site, there, you feel satisfied that now you know you know something that you didn't know before. I make it again informative, educational, 
cite the ser your sources, right? Um, so, so those are some of the things. So there are some questions that you can, when you're writing content that you can ask yourself to test, okay, is this, is this content good content? Is it quality content? So is it helpful, right? Again, I, I, I know I'm repeating myself, but just be very honest, read your content. Is, is, is this gonna really help somebody? If you're just, you know, taking a bunch of pieces of all their articles and just meshing them together and just throwing them on a, on a site, is that really gonna be helpful? That's one of the, 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 the guidelines from Google. Don't just take pieces from other, from other sites and put them together. Just add your own flavor, make it unique, right? Does it demonstrate that you have experience, right? Are you, or are you just guessing or speculating? Right. So let's say if you're if you're you have a travel site, can you demonstrate you travel to the place and then you have pictures or you have somebody that went there and, and have firsthand experience? If you're talking about a product, like did you really try the product yourself? Do you have a video? Do you have a picture of the product? Right. That's gonna be more 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 helpful if you're doing a product review than just you know citing all the features. But but if you have something that's really gonna give you more insights uh, to a user. And then that's a way to, to test your content. And the, the other question could be, is there a reason for people to listen to me or listen to, to, my, to my author, right? That author is known, that author uh, has some authority in the, in the market. So there's, there's some, some questions that you can ask yourself to test that you have high quality content. How would someone who is following those guidelines, and I really wanted to lean in on your experience, your topic of experience, and you talk, have you used that product? Have you been to that location? have you, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? How would someone work with a content agency like yourself to help them scale content, but still retain or be a part of that experience level? Let's say I'm a travel blogger and I just went somewhere and I did a lot of activities there, but I don't, you know, I want to hire a content team or company like yours. How would I, you know, like, how do you guys work in that? How, how do you recommend someone think, about that if they're the person right now who's doing all the writing themselves, but hitting scale and hitting problems with growing. Yeah, so there are, there are many ways to create a process uh, to create that authoritativeness, right? And create and translate that expertise. And sometimes people, you know, get confused. A writer is, is somebody that is conveying information. The writer doesn't necessarily have to be the person that does everything, does experiment, is goal, right? So I myself, sometimes I use writers that help me put these ideas together. I sit down with the writer you know, and I can give them my, this is what I want the content to be. These are my ideas. And the writer just makes it a really nice piece because I'm not a writer, right? I'm a manager. I'm not, I'm not trained in writing. I'm not, I don't know if I can even write well. So that's the difference. So if you, if you have the expertise, let's say you have a, a travel website and you're the one traveling, maybe you, you, you have your, the recordings of your travel, you have your notes, maybe you voice notes, or so our advice to clients is create pretty good outlines. So spend the time to create a, a content outline, a content brief with resources that the writer can use to produce a really nice piece of content, right? And then you can, if you're the expert, then you can fact check it and, buy, and put your name on the article and byline the article. You don't have to write every single word, but you can fact check it. We have a process for subject matter experts where we pair really good subject matter experts with really good writers. A lot of people sometimes come to us, oh, I want a, a doctor to write my articles. Well, there is no MD that is going to write an article for $100. You know what I mean? They're making $1,000 an hour. They're not, but, but we can find some MDs that are willing to fact check your, your, an article, right? And who's to say that and then he's also going to be a good writer that's very rare <laughs> you know what i mean so we we really what we do is that we pair really good writers ghost writers with a strong smes in different verticals so we have an scalable process otherwise it would be very hard to scale right if you want a doctor trying to write uh 50 articles that's that's not going to happen or at least not in, a, in an affordable way so we have created this workflow we have a writer, then we have the SME fact checking the, the piece of content. And then we have an editor that put all those two pieces together, make sure it flows, that it reads nicely. There's, you know, the grammar, the style, everything is, is tight. So, but my advice is spend the time up front, really good outlines. So you have the, you, you, you garbage in, garbage out, right? If you produce really good inputs for the writer, 
the writer is going to be able to produce a really good piece. And then you can put a, um, you compare the writer with an expert, whether it's yourself or a, a, an expert you hire or to a company like ours. And then you can have that expertise added to, to your piece of content. Does that make sense? It does. It does. I actually want to keep going down this road. I love this. I love that we're landing here. And I'm going to be a little stereotypical. I'm going to kind of juxtapose maybe the two extremes and ask you for your advice. Because I think a lot of people who have their own websites and who are growing their own content sites right now, they land maybe in one of two camps. They will do all the writing themselves. And that's a great way to maintain quality and and maintain control, but it limits your ability to scale. It, It limits how much you can put into the business. And then you have maybe the other side of the camp where people either get frustrated with that or don't even start that way, but they come out swinging and they just outsource all the content and have a very, very hands-off approach where they're not involved. I keep feeling like you're talking about kind of living in the middle and being a part and having an authority and, and being able to convey your expertise while still relying on a writer or a writing team to help you scale out so you can kind of focus on it. You talked about outlines. What other tips do you have for, for living in the middle, for being a content creator that still has all this experience that gets conveyed their, through, through the articles, but doesn't have to be the one writing all of them. Yeah, and I think this is all come, up, come down to what are your strengths? If you started, if you started a, a content site, did you start a content site because you're a true writer and you really are passionate about writing and writing really good informational pieces? Then that's fair and fine. But then maybe you need to, you know, outsource your website, you know, setting your website and all of your SEO because that's what you're good at. But if you are good at being an entrepreneur and maybe, maybe monetizing and finding new opportunities and finding new niches and finding new, new, new uh, topics, then that's what you're good at. Then get somebody that is good at writing so you can, you can, you know, exploit that combination or get the best of both worlds. What I'm trying to say is we all need to be very honest to ourselves and and, and and what are we good at and I know when a lot of entrepreneurs are starting off they want to do everything themselves right and probably that's the right thing to do at the beginning because you want to understand the process but then if you really want to scale you need to decide okay um, I might is where's where am I going to get the biggest bang for for my buck me writing the pieces myself or me focusing on the opportunities out there and how I grow this, this little business. Do I grow it by monetizing it, looking for new new niches, new topics? What is it? And then you, you decide, and then the rest that you're not good at, then you hire people for, or outsource. Or And I know very, it's very easy for me to say, some people might be listening and say, well, but I can't even afford to hire myself, right? Yeah. But at some point, you need to think about what how much is my time worth, right? And then put a price to that and say, like, if my hour is $150, right? If I think I'm worth $150, can I hire somebody to do other stuff? You know, because you don't want to pay yourself $150 to do stuff that you can outsource for $50. You know what I, what I mean? If you can get somebody to do that thing for a, a fraction of your personal cost or your opportunity cost, then why, why not do it? So the best clients that we have are clients that spend a good amount of time at the the front end and are very collaborative with us as well. So at the beginning, they set out their their strategy. They set out, you know, this is what we want to achieve. This is the research. And they give us really, really good briefs. They have a really well thought out style guide and we're able to capture their voice, their tone, their intent. And they're very good at communicating that with us and we're very good at understanding it. And then you know, we keep an iterative process, right? They're not like, okay, no, no, I'm done. And then I, I talk to you in six months when all the content is done. It's more like, okay, we almost sometimes have to force our clients to give us feedback on every piece because the, the, the feedback is what makes us better and make sure that we're hitting their hitting their their bar. So it's a very collaborative process. We're we're almost an extension of their team, right? So we and the reason we I think we have been successful is because we spend a lot of time at the front end with our clients, understanding them. We spend up to six weeks trying to understand all their goals, their process, what they're trying to achieve, their voice, their tone, um, all things that they want. And then after we launch, uh, now we're in full launch with or, or in a scale up pro, uh, phase with a client, we go back to feedback, like on a, on, on every piece of content, 
right? And then we, if we need to recalibrate uh, because goals change and, and, and things change along the way, we keep doing that. But it has to be uh, something in the middle. It cannot be, you know, do you do everything or you do nothing and then just fully hands off? It has to be a very collaborative approach because, you know, content is, is a little bit of an art, right? So it's not, it's not that easy. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, it has to be somewhere in the middle because both sides eventually will fail if you're trying to scale, but maintain that that expert and uniqueness about what your website is. What other tips do you have for scaling content, whether it's on a process or a mindset or, I mean, what what success stories have you seen where people have scaled content and done it successfully um, throughout that whole process? Yeah, so I think there are a few a few steps that you can take uh, if you want to um, scale content. And to scale content is all about the process. So you need to really spend a lot of time at the beginning designing the process. Okay, so how am I going to do my keyword research? How am I going to come up with the topics? You know, how am I going to create the outlines or the briefs for the writers? Uh, how am I going to do the editing, the, the, the review, the content? The, the, how am I going to pair with an expert? How am I going to publish this? So it's, it's, it's good sitting down and designing that process. And there are many templates out there I've seen uh, 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 that will tell you how you should think about the process. So spend the time thinking about the process. Mm-hmm. After you thought about the process, now assemble the right team. Okay. Do I need a content manager? Do I need people to do the research? Of course, the writer, the writers, the editors, graphic designers, SEO experts, a lot of things. People sometimes think about, okay, I'm going to get content, so I need a writer. But they forgot, okay, I need somebody for the images. I need somebody to publish it. I need somebody going to, going to look at the SEO part. So uh, maybe maybe this could be one person, because if you're a one, one person shop or two people shop, that's okay. But you need to think about it, right? Like somebody has to do these tasks. Uh, and what is the right team to do it, right? Do you want to hire yourself? Do you want to go uh, to a freelance platform, Upwork, Fiverr, or, or, or a platform like ours? Um, right, assembling that team, thinking through, okay, what is the team going to look like? After you assemble a team, then you have to develop your content strategy. And it's going to be, okay, now I have my topics, now I have my, my different keywords, and then my goal is to publish one article a week, two articles a week, 10 a month. I don't know. Then, you create that calendar so you stay, you know, kind of a roadmap, right? Just you, you stay on course. Then now that you have your calendar, you should create a style guide, even if it is small, right? Even if it is like, this is my voice, this is my tone. I want it to be informal, I want it to be formal, I want it to be, you know, first uh, uh, first person, second person, third person, right? I want it to be playful, I want it to be uh, witty, right? Like all those things is good to think about. So especially if you're going to use, um, if you're going to start using either a, your own writer or an outsource, you need to think this through because again, the writers are people are, are their, their mission is to convey information, but they need good input so they can create a great output. But it's good for you because the, the moment that you want to scale, people need to capture how you want to sound. What is the personality of your, of your website, right? So you need to create that style guide and, um, and think it through. Then, I would launch a pilot because now that you have the, 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 the process, you have the, the team and you have your content calendar, you, you shouldn't just go pedal to the metal. You need to test it out. Just if your goal is to create hundred pieces of content, okay, let's launch five under this process. Let's see how it goes. Let's work out the kinks. And then when we work out the kinks, Ned, now we can go full scale, right? Cause is, and even if after you go full scale, after maybe the next 20 pieces, you should stop and, and, and keep recalibrating until you feel comfortable with the process, right? So it's good to do a pilot phase at the beginning and test out this process so you can work out the kinks because you don't want to do it with a hundred pieces and now go and have to rewrite them all, right? You want to do you want to fail fail fast with with, with with a small sample and then when when you know what what works and what doesn't, then you kind of scale up. And then now that you have done all this, now you now is the, the time to scale up and then wash, rinse, and repeat. Right? That's a good. That's I think. If people are interested in how to scale their content, that's a good, that's a good five minute outline. You can probably listen to that a couple of times, take some notes. That's a good outline, especially the part about not going too fast. You know, a lot of times people will kind of figure out their process and then put in the time, right? They'll put in that time to come up with a process, but inherently there's always something that's going to be a little bit broken or just need improvement. And if you go 
pedal to the metal for hundred articles, man, you're gonna have to go back and you have to fix all hundred of those, even if it is just a small little thing, but testing that process, making iterations. And then once you finally have it really locked and loaded, then going forward, I think that's a really, you know, a really good thing I wanted to highlight that you said. Yeah. And I think it's one of the, the biggest mistakes that we see when people try to scale content is going uh, too much, too fast without a proven process. We have seen it ourselves, even with clients that we, that haven't, you know, they, they haven't worked out is because they try to, you know, they try to run before they can even crawl, right? So you have to follow the process because going too fast is, is likely going to gonna break. Like we have seen it. Uh, so trust me on this one. Taking a bit of a left turn, but I want to get your thoughts on it. There's, we've talked a lot on this podcast about the different, I'll say, approaches to content creation. And when I mean approaches, I mean some will focus on really, really long tail, low competition keywords. And so they'll take the topic that their website is about, and they'll just try to find as many low topic or uh, low competition keywords as possible. Others will advocate for maybe more of what's called like a cluster approach or an approach that's going to be focused around getting topical authority. So they'll find all the topics that they think a website about this would need to cover. And they'll write those. Some will be lower competition. Some will be higher competition. But their goal in that case would be to get topical authority. You work with a lot of brands and a lot of content creators. What are your thoughts on which approach to take or if there's maybe a third approach or a different approach that you see working the best today? I really like the the cluster approach and really the the topical authority approach. Because again, it's very aligned with people first content, right? You want to become the place to go. And sometimes... Uh, what what we what, what I like personally about it is that your your readers are not going to come only for one question. They're going to come sometimes for all the questions, right? So I want to know about garden tools, then or maybe about these one garden tools. But maybe in the back of my head, I would because I'm I'm, I'm passionate about gardening. I want to know about all these other garden tools. But if you focus on you know that cluster, like everything around garden tools, why not be the authority? I think is better off to, you're better off being an authority in one topic or in one cluster in a couple of clusters than trying to be, you know, a million of long tail keyword. You know, I I don't know if, uh, you know, if I, if I, this is my personal opinion, the topic cluster gives you more authority, uh, authority and expertise. So you're better off becoming one, one expert in one particular topic rather than becoming uh, not an expert in many, many different topics, if that makes sense around the long tail keywords, because then those long tail keywords can take you into rabbit holes and kind of drift away from the main topic. If that makes sense. So mm-hmm. I might make my preferred approach is, is to, uh, topic clustering, going really, really deep into one particular topic. Um, so yeah, you know, for affiliates, if they're in one niche, be, be the best in that particular niche that you can. Uh, right to try to be in a, in, a, in a bunch of different niches or trying to go after these low low competition keywords. All right, we, we've been we've been talking for a while. I, I want to ask you. I feel like we have a good rapport, so I feel like I can go there with you. <laughs> but <laughs> obviously, in this year, even past years, and in, in the future, AI content is starting to become both a buzzword, overused, well used. <laughs> We're going to see a lot of the extensions of AI content in the coming years, it seems as though it's, it does have a place in writing going forward. What are your thoughts on AI content? What are your thoughts on where it does serve a content creator well, if any, and where it doesn't serve a content creator well? Yeah, uh, I love this topic. You know, sometimes I feel uh, every disrupt technology or every, every new technology have this face, right? And have this boss face, you know, when the, the dot com, anybody with a, with a URL now is making millions of dollars and everybody jumps on the train and, you know, and then it busts. But it doesn't mean the technology is not good. It just means that because it gets so much bust, you know, it creates a bubble, right? You know, when electric cars came in like decades or two decades ago, everybody was like, oh my God, this is going to change the world. But it takes a while for the technology to finally settle. So I, I feel we're still in the bust phase with AI content. I think it's, it's, it's just a tool, like uh, like a, a lot of technologies. Technologies are just tools to make things easier. Now, of course, the media loves to 
are to to open up the debate is is AI content going to replace human content? And I personally think it, it won't. It just will become a tool to make the writers more 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 efficient, like like everything, right? Like back in the day when people were doing accounting and finance, they would use things by hand. Now we have Excel. And now they are hundred times faster, right? So I think AI has a place and will have a place to help people be able to produce better content because they're going to be faster and they're not going to have to write every single little word. Really, how we see AI working out is that, you know, helping um, writers sometimes uh, overcome writer block, uh, ideate, you know, play with, with words and iterate with their paragraphs. Um, I, there's some people that think AI hey, writing, you go push a button and then there's an article. Yeah, but that's not really how it is. Um, it is, a real, we call it code writing. So it's really the machine and the human writing together, right? So the, the human is still giving it the, a lot of the essence, a lot of the, the input, and the machine is just helping create paragraphs and ideate and, and come up with some of the, of the data that, that, that might be needed. So we have, we actually, with when we acquire content refined, we also acquire Rocket Content, which is one of their brands. Uh, and that's AI powered content. And the place for that kind of content is, is very cost effective for people that want to um, experiment with, um, with different topics or different keywords. So, and this, this, um, this type of content is not intended to you know, rank first in the SERP, it's intended for people that want to. Try, try new concepts and new and new and new ideas. So they come to us. We create a, a a set of articles for them to test them out, right? And maybe get them to try to to at least get index or and then when they when they test those experiments, they say, okay, this this topic, these keywords, they work. Let's invest. Let's double down on them. Now let's you know invest more in that content. And if not, then let's move to an experiment, right? So you want to experiment with, uh, with low cost and, and fast. So this is a fast option to do that and a very uh, cost-effective option. And where I see, I think is going to be a bigger part of a writing. Right now we have that brand that is doing that particular product, but I think we're, we're looking for ways in how do we incorporate in our workflow to make our process faster. So we're not um, experimental with creating briefs by AI. So the AI is going to create a template or an outline, and, and then we can provide that to the writer. Or can we you know, uh, train the writers to use the AI tool to help them write faster? But I think it's really not, it's not yet to a point that it's going to replace good human writing. And I, what I think is going to happen as Google keep pushing the bar of quality content, you know, good content will come, uh, continue to rise to the top. And maybe there is going to be a tsunami of AI low quality content that is going to push all that great content still to the top, right? So I think, you know, you, 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 there is a space for it, but people need to understand really uh, that really good quality content is not going to be created exclusively by a machine. You cannot push a button and 100% uh, article produced by, 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 by one of these AI tools is going to be a great, a great piece of content. It's not. And you can, you know, I read many of them that they just gibberish or fluff or, or they're making sense. But I have read also good uh, AI powered co uh, content because they were coupled with a really good human that, you know, gave it the essence and kind of instructed the tool to go the right way. You mentioned AI for article briefs. I, I, I It's funny, I have that on my list to ask you about and, and you just mentioned it a bit. Uh, do you, It sounds like you, you could see a place there for it, maybe harnessing AI to help brainstorm the right topics and then um, and use it and use it there yeah no for sure that's something uh, one of the things that we're testing and we we want to launch uh to offer clients hey because creating a brief it takes a lot of time right uh, yeah. sometimes the brief i've seen briefs are longer than the article right this is is, is funny so um i think there's potential there uh because just creating instruction creating templates and why not automating that part of uh, of the work which is and again takes takes a lot of it now there's a just recently jasper came with uh, uh art ai art and it's, right it's pretty cool because you sometimes you want graphics and one uh drawings and then you can give this this thing a few words and then come out with a drawing so i think it's going to continue to evolve there's going to be a bunch of different applications um but i mean i don't i don't know this is me speculating i don't know if it ever will replace uh good human writing because you know humans can still i don't think uh, a machine can be as creative as a human yet. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's certainly, it's going to be interesting to see how all this progresses, but as someone who's, you know, working at the head of a large content producing agency, it's fascinating to hear your perspective on it, how to use it best, where it works best. I forgot that you guys now also have uh, rocket content under your, um, under your umbrella. So that's actually even more fascinating to hear you guys are actively working in AI. I mean, if I were to, if I were to interpret a little bit about what I heard you say, you know, do you think there's a strategy with AI to publish a series of articles around a certain topic and then just let them sit and wait to see what index is? And then based on how Google responds to your site producing some of this AI content, then you circle back and then add human elements or maybe even rewrite the entire article based on what you see Google um, liking, indexing, starting to rank. Uh, it, it, did, I, did I hear that right? Is that a yeah. good synopsis of it? Yeah, yeah. And we have seen it. We have seen it already. We have a few. Um, I asked uh, Narcissus, who is uh, the business manager for for Country Fine and Rock Content, to give me a few um, case studies of our clients and Rock Content. And we, we see, you know, some of these, uh, some of them have uh, been able to index some, some new sites, some new pages and gain some, some decent traffic. So now the next phase is, okay, let's double down on the ones, on the winners, Let's you know get rid of the losers, double down on the winners, and now let's go and, and look for more more opportunities. And that's a, that's a, that's a good process for somebody that that want to experiment with concepts, right? Is 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 uh, is a is a very cost effective way to do it. Ah, oh, that's really interesting. It's very interesting. Well, let's talk as we close out here about uh, about crowd content and then how it merged or works with content refined. Uh, obviously, you mentioned we had Narcissus on a while back, and content refined is a pretty established name and in content creation, at least in this in this niche, what um, what led you guys to merge or to crowd control uh, taking over content refined? And tell us a little bit more about if anything has changed in terms of of those two brands. Yeah, so we have a, a pretty ambitious acquisition strategy and a pretty ambitious growth strategy. So we want to continue to grow organically, continue bringing clients with our with our main brands. And but also we want to acquire other 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 um, content writing platforms or content writing agencies because there is a very fragmented industry and we think there is an opportunity to um, to, to consolidate and, and provide a better a better uh, value for for the users and for the clients out there. So really, Content Refine was one of the first uh, acquisitions that we did on crowd content. We're a content writing platform with a um, uh, with the freelance model. You know, similar to, to other platforms out there. So all of our writers are freelancers, but we have to business model. We have a marketplace, pretty self-serve. People come in, they do everything on their own. They find their own writers. They talk to the writers, et cetera. We have a managed services, which is really the high-end enterprise kind of product. And we work, work with very large, you know, Fortune 2000 companies and very large brands or very large media publishers. But there was a gap between those two. We see a lot of clients that are not a large brand, are not, you know, don't have the volume to be a managed enterprise client, but also need a little bit more help uh, than just going solo in the marketplace and trying to do everything on their own. So uh, Country Fine, Nurse and his team, done a, they do a great job to, to helping people that only have a URL and an idea. <laughs> And they say, this is, look, I only have a site. I don't know really exactly what to do. I don't know how to even do keyword research and, and all these uh, content briefs. So help me, right? And the, the Content Refine has great packages for that kind of profile. They're really good for affiliates uh, because again, these are uh, mom and pops or, or, or somebody doing it on the corner of the desk. They don't want to invest a lot of money, uh, but also don't have the ability to hire an SEO expert, a researcher, all that stuff. So they can come to Content Refine and have a more, you know, a little bit more handholding, a little bit more, um, more help around strategy and pu um, pu publication because we do all the all the silk to nuts, right? So all the way from keyword research and ideation and topic uh, generation brief, all the way to publishing. So it's a great solution for people that need a little bit more help that don't have the kind of budget to be kind of a, a fully managed service client and need more help than doing it, everything on their own as a marketplace client. Also, the other thing that was appealing to us was the whole AI product they had, they had lunch because we, 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 we saw this AI um, topic coming up and coming up and said, well, look, we want to learn about it. We want to kind of look at how it behaves 
is there really a, a value to to the market out there with this product? So it was it was a good way to get into that um, without having to start from scratch and creating our own products. So I think it's just complementing our portfolio of services for our clients. It's great, good distinction. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, well, Carlos, it's been really interesting to hear from someone at the top levels of content creation about, I mean, the whole you know gamut of things we talked about. I really appreciate you stopping by and uh, introducing yourself and, and kind of lending your thoughts here on, on content creation. I particularly enjoyed all your tips on scale and how to scale that process out, <laughs> not by doing it where you just pull the pin and throw it over the fence and hope it all works out well, but by actually being a part of the process, but how you can get results at scale without having to do it all yourself. So, uh, yeah, so anyways, thanks for coming on and, and bringing so much value. No, thanks. I really appreciate the invite and uh, yeah, giving me the opportunity to, to speak about a topic that I'm super passionate about. So where can people catch up with you and follow along with what you're doing? Uh, tell us, uh, also give us uh, the, the, you know, the information on uh, both crowd content and content refined. Yeah, awesome. So look, uh, the crowd content family, crowd content, content refined, and rocket content, and, and, and especially crowd content, we're all about quality at a scale. Right? So people want to have quality writing at a large scale. We are, we are the place to go. Um, we are really, really disciplined around making sure we have the best writers and we, have, we can really deliver content to our clients, uh, quality content to our clients. Or guarantee we have love your content guarantee. That's our motto. Either you love it or it's guaranteed that you love it or, or you get your money back or, you're, or you're, you will do the piece until, you're, until you love it. So because we're, we're very proud and very judicious about making sure that we have high quality. Content Refine is a great place for people that you know, are starting off or that, have, you know, that don't have the volume or the resources to go uh, to crowd content, but also need a lot of help. And Rocket Content is the place to experiment, to be playful with, uh, with some concepts and some, some ideas, right? And if you want to seed some sites in a cost-effective manner, that's the place to go. You can follow me on LinkedIn. I try to, to publish a, 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 a valuable content for people who are interested in, in content marketing and, 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 and lead generation, things around digital marketing. Uh, I'm Twitter as well. I'm a Carlos J. Mesa. I think <laughs> not, very, not very easy to, to, to find Carlos J. Mesa. One, uh, LinkedIn, Carlos Mesa. Uh, on our blog, we are trying to publish as, as much stuff as possible that is helpful. Like again, we're, we're eating our own, uh, our own dog food. So we published recently an article around the, the, the May core update and it ranked very well because we, we put a lot of thought into it. We actually got it to rank above Google's, uh, Google's article about the core update because we put a lot of love into, into, our, own, into our own content. So go to our blog, there's very, uh, a lot of useful resources. We launched a bunch of webinars. We'll be having, um, you know, big names uh, coming up. So we, we try to give our, 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 our audience and our clients and our prospects, you know, really good, insightful information around the whole content marketing game. I'll, I'll make sure we get some of that in the show notes too. So people can click and head over. Um, that's cool. <laughs> Carlos, thanks so much for joining us. Till we talk again next time. Have a good one. Thank you, Jared. You have a good one too.